on world news tonight. Asia gathers. Chinese President Xi Jinping gathers the Central Asian nations in a summit set to rival the ongoing G7 meeting. New avenues. Syrian President Assad lands in Saudi port city of Jeddah to hold talks, the first time since the end of the war. Blasting off. South Korea launches its third Nuri rocket into space, holding many functional satellites meant to improve global communication. She is welcome. The Chinese president welcomes the leaders of the Central Asian states with an elegant gala and a spectacular light display. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News where we bring to you the latest from around the planet. This Friday evening, we have a variety of stories ranging from competing summits to refugee crises. Firstly, we start off in China's Xiang region, where the leaders of Central Asia gathered for a summit. Chinese President Xi Jinping unveiled a grand plan for Central Asia's development, from building infrastructure to boosting trade, taking on a new leadership role in a region that has traditionally been a Russian sphere of influence. China is ready to coordinate development strategies with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan to promote the modernization of all. With its engagement, China has put itself at the forefront of the race for the political influence and energy assets in the resource-rich region, with Russia distracted by its war in Ukraine and the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan diminishing the U.S. presence in the region. She said China and the Central Asian countries should deepen trust and offer clear and strong support on core interests such as sovereignty, independence, national dignity and long-term development. The five former Soviet republics with a network of trade corridors offer China alternative routes to transport fuel, food and other commodities in the event of disruptions elsewhere. The pledges of support and cooperation at the two-day summit will present a contrast to a negative image of China invoked at a summit of group of seven leaders in Japan from Friday. China's support for Central Asia also appears to be counterweight to US accusations of its core self-diplomacy. Now over to the Western Leaning Summit, US President Joe Biden and Japan's Fumio Kishida met for talks in the deeply symbolic city of Hiroshima, aiming for closer cooperation in the face of an ascendant China and an unpredictable Russia they see as threatening the post-war order. US President Joe Biden met with the leader of Japan in the city of Hiroshima. It's here the three-day Group of Seven Summit will start on Friday. And it's perhaps a fitting location for the Great Power Conference. Here, in the first city ever hit with an atomic weapon, G7 members, which include host Japan, along with the U.S., Germany, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, and Canada, are increasingly concerned by what they see as Russia's repeated threats over the use of nuclear arms. They're also alarmed by an ascendant China, with economically coercive policies and its rapid accumulation of sensitive technology. Biden and Japan's Fumio Kishida met for talks Thursday, aiming for closer cooperation in the face of these challenges. As you said back in January when you were at the White House, I think the quote is, we face the most, one of the most complex environments in recent history, security environments. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm proud that the United States and Japan are facing it together. And, uh, you know, we stand up for the shared values, including supporting brave people in Ukraine as they defend their sovereign territory and holding Russia accountable for its new aggression. Japan, although a longtime buyer of Russian oil, has moved in tandem with G7 sanctions against Moscow following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That military action has also raised fears among Japanese that China could be emboldened to take action against neighboring, self-ruled Taiwan, unless Russia is stopped. The U.S. will have a package of sanctions associated with a G7 statement that will center on the tightening and enforcement of Russian sanctions, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters on board Air Force One. As for China, which is currently hosting a summit of Central Asian leaders, officials from G7 member countries have said in private that tackling the country's rise isn't an easy task, particularly given the West's immense reliance on China as both a trade partner and, in some cases, a manufacturing base. 
Over in our northeast neighbor Myanmar, residents of the cyclone ravaged Rakhine state capital queued for rice and drinking water as the United Nations negotiated with the international isolated junta for access to hard hit areas. Cyclone Mokato through Myanmar and Bangladesh bringing lashing rain and winds of 195 kilometers per hour that collapsed buildings and turned streets into rivers. It's being called a humanitarian catastrophe. As Myanmar's Rakhine state reels from the devastating cyclone Mocha, residents search for food and water. In the capital of the region, water purification plants are shut down as a consequence of the storm, leaving the city of some 150,000 people without a supply of drinkable water. While some can afford to purchase the precious resource for a high price, those from poorer communities are left to rely on aid. I've been queuing for 30 minutes. This is my place and many people are in front of me. I just wanted to get two water tanks. I think this is the only place in Sitwe that is giving water. Same scenario in this monastery where the United Nations World Food Programme has set up temporary accommodation. Here, people are rushing to receive bags of rice. I haven't eaten for four days. I don't have bowls, plates or a home. I don't even have clothes to change. I'm here to ask for rice as my family is starving. However, Cyclone Mocha has cut off certain areas in Myanmar from the world, making aid access difficult. The United Nations say negotiations with Myanmar's military junta for access to cyclone-affected areas are still ongoing. The memory of Cyclone Nargis in 2008 remains ever-present. The then junta was accused of blocking emergency aid and initially refusing to grant access to humanitarian workers and supplies. Uh, and it's now estimated uh, that at least three million people are going to need uh, humanitarian uh, aid, uh, emergency humanitarian aid, as a direct result of the cyclone. But the humanitarian response capacity is limited because of severe uh, underfunding. This underfunding could affect the Rohingya exiles in particular. Rakhine State is home to around 600,000 Rohingya, with several hundred thousand members of this ethnic group living in the areas affected by the cyclone between Myanmar and neighboring Bangladesh. In the Middle East, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has arrived in the Saudi port city of Jeddah. Al-Assad will attend the Arab League summit after Syria was reinstated to the regional organization this month, more than 11 years after its suspension. Stepping off a plane in Jeddah, Bashar al-Assad was greeted with handshakes and smiles. Once a pariah among the Arab League, the 22 member countries are welcoming the Syrian president back. Earlier this month, the Arab world's top diplomats agreed to fully reinstate Syria's membership after a 12-year suspension over Assad's crackdown on protesters during the Arab Spring Uprising in 2011. The conflict evolved into a civil war that has left hundreds of thousands of people dead and displaced millions of Syrians within the country. Isolated on the world stage, Assad turned to Russia and Iran, carrying out acts that human rights groups say make him a war criminal, someone who does not deserve to be legitimized by other Arab nations. Diplomatic contact intensified between Damascus and Arab countries following two massive earthquakes that hit Syria and Turkey back in February, killing more than 6,000 Syrians. And while members of the Arab League are divided over normalizing relations with Assad, he now has a seat at the table. Still subject to American and European sanctions for his war atrocities, critics say Assad has paid little price to be readmitted into the Arab fold. South Korea will take another significant step for its space industry with the third launch of its homegrown space rocket, Nuri. Nuri will have eight actual satellites on board rather than dummy satellites as used before. South Korea's aerospace history will be rewritten on May 24th. The Nuri space rocket's third launch is completely different from the two previous ones. The first and second launches in October 2021 and June 2022 were test launches with dummies, but this time it's the first operational launch carrying eight actual satellites. So, which satellites will be on board? First, 
the largest and heaviest main payload satellites, next generation small satellites the second, made by KAIST, will be placed at the front of the third stage of NURI. It has a main camera with a resolution of 5 meters, an observation width of 40 kilometers, and weighs 150 kilograms to help it explore 600 to 800 kilometers of mission altitude ranges. It uses an imaging radar that is not affected by light or clouds, day and night, or even severe weather conditions. NEXAT the second is primarily a satellite that captures radar images. It is a synthetic satellite that sends radar waves and detects the return waves to create composite images. It differs from the optical camera images and has differences in performance compared to the existing five satellite due to its scale. Four Doyasat, named after small but fast birds, developed by the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute, will also be on board. It is also known as SNIPE, small-scale magnetospheric and ionospheric plasma experiment. The world's very first will four satellites fly in formation to observe space weather. Four nanosatellites, Karam, Dare, Tasol and Laon about 10 kilograms each, will provide real-time transmission of fine space plasma distribution, Earth's magnetic field, solar wind and space storms at a mission altitude of 500 kilometers. In this third launch, the achievements of Korean satellite manufacturing companies are noticeable. The space radiation detector by Lumir, the optical payload by Justac, and the polarimetric camera by Cairo Space will perform their respective missions. In particular, Cairo Space's Cube satellites will come back to Earth automatically without space debris after the mission is complete. These eight satellites will be a milestone for Korea as a space powerhouse, venturing into space with the country's cutting-edge technology. We'll be back with more world news of this short commercial break. Welcome back. The Ukrainian military and Russia's Wagner private army both reported further Russian retreats on the outskirts of Bakhmut as Kyiv pressed on with its biggest advance in six months ahead of a planned counteroffensive. The Ukrainian military on Thursday released footage purporting to show its forces attacking and destroying Russian units near the eastern city of Bakhmut. It has been unable to confirm the location or the date of the video, which was posted to social media by Ukraine's top commander. Both Kyiv and a Russian mercenary group reported further Russian retreats around the city. Kyiv says it has launched local advances as a prelude to an upcoming big counteroffensive that it hopes will turn the tide against Russia's 15-month-old invasion. Ukraine's military said troops had advanced in places by more than a mile, and Ukraine's deputy defense minister said that day-long Russian attacks in the city had been repelled. However, the commander of the Wagner paramilitary group leading the Russian assault on Bakhmut claimed his forces were still advancing on Thursday. But Yevgeny Prigozhin accused commanders of Russia's regular forces of abandoning ground north and south of the city, raising the risk of troops inside being encircled. Near the front line, Ukrainian troops said Russia was bombarding access roads to slow the advances, which has shifted the momentum after months of slow Russian gains. Andrei Kornyi commands an air defense division near the front line. The shelling is ongoing. You can see for yourself that it seems to have calmed down a bit. But they are constantly working like this, constantly looking for something, somewhere. They are covering us with fire. Well, they work. It's obvious they're digging in, and they want to show us how strong they are. The Russian Defense Ministry has acknowledged some withdrawals from positions near Bakhmut over the past week, but denied Prigozhin's assertions that flanks are crumbling. China's Alibaba Group posted a 2% rise in quarterly revenue that missed expectations and said its board has approved a spin-off of its cloud computing business. Alibaba warehouses have been busy, but not quite as busy as some expected. On Thursday, the Chinese e-commerce giant said quarterly revenue rose 2% to just over $30 billion. That was less than analysts expected. Chinese consumer spending has regained some momentum since the country ended strict lockdowns. 
but economists say demand remains very muted amid a wobbly recovery. The company is also grappling with mounting competition from new rivals such as the Chinese version of TikTok. Earlier this year, Alibaba said it would restructure into six units, with each one expected to go public. On Thursday, it said the Cloud Intelligence Group would complete a spin-off within 12 months. It's also looking at doing share sales for divisions, including the logistics unit. The sources have said that arm could aim to raise $2 billion in a Hong Kong IPO. The company's digital commerce group has also begun the process of seeking external funding. Ecuador's President Guillermo Lasso issued a decree dissolving the National Assembly, ending impeachment proceedings against him. Lasso is applying a constitutional mechanism known as two-way death, allowing the president to call elections for his post and the assembly under certain circumstances. Tonight, political turmoil in Ecuador and what could be the end of one of the last remaining conservative leaders in Latin America. <laughs> The country's president, Guillermo Lasso, terminating the impeachment proceedings against him with a drastic measure, dissolving the National Assembly. He decidido aplicar el artículo 148 de la Constitución de la República que me otorga la facultad de disolver la Asamblea Nacional por grave crisis política y conmoción interna. National police now prohibiting former assembly members from entering the legislative building. The constitutional tool dubbed La Muerte Cruzada, which translates to a two-way death, also effectively ending Lasso's own presidency in six months. Lasso forced into the lose-lose situation, facing impeachment over accusations of embezzlement related to an oil shipping contract before he took office. Los acusadores. Se han obsesionado por acabar con mi gobierno. The latest political strife for Lasso comes amidst brutally low approval ratings since the start of his presidency in 2021. A recent Perfiles de Opinión survey showing only 13% of Ecuadorians see Lasso in a positive light. Other domestic challenges erupting last June. Violent clashes between supporters of indigenous groups and police over the price of gasoline and food. Authorities deploying water cannons and tear gas. Lasso calling the demonstrations an attempted coup. Hacemos un llamado a la comunidad internacional para advertir de este intento de desestabilizar la democracia en el Ecuador. In January 2022, a broken oil pipeline causing an environmental disaster in the Ecuadorian rainforest. And the nation beset by years of prison riots, leaving hundreds of inmates dead. The future of the country now up to voters. Sudanese refugees fleeing from their homeland due to the escalating violence have chosen neighboring Chad as their new home. But this does not come without its own issues and problems. Have a look. This is Halime Adam Musa. She's one of the 60,000 Sudanese refugees who have fled Sudan for Chad since the war broke out on April 15. For her, it's a repeat journey. The first time was in 2003, when she fled her village of Tidelti in Sudan's western region of Darfur. In the past, we lived peacefully on our crops of cereals, peanuts and vegetables, which we sold on the local markets to provide for our needs. We lived like this until the Arab militias came and turned everything upside down by driving us into exile. A mother of seven, she spent six years in a refugee camp in Chad before being allocated a small plot of land to farm. She went back to Darfur in 2020. Now, the fighting in Sudan has forced her to flee again. She shares her meager resources with her children and grandchildren who fled to Delta with her. If you have land, even if you have no money, you can sell your produce to survive. But when you have nothing, you suffer. Chad was already struggling to cope before the latest influx of Darfuris. The country has one of the worst hunger problems in the world. In total, 2.3 million people in Chad are in urgent need of food aid. More than a third of its children under five are stunted. The United Nations World Food Programme issued an urgent appeal for $162.4 million to help feed them. 
The organization warns that without more funding, food assistance for refugees and Chadians risks drying up. Welcome back. For more news, let's take it on the world in a minute. Romanog Formula One Grand Prix at Imola will not be held this weekend due to extreme weather in the northern Italian region. The Grand Prix, a home race for Ferrari, was scheduled to be the first triple header of the season, with Monaco and Spain following on successive weekends. Greece's main opposition leader Alexis Tsipras held his main campaign rally in Central Athens across the parliament as the country readied for parliamentary vote on May 21st. Thousands of party supporters gathered at the rally waving flags and flares filling the capital's main square. Tens of thousands of Israeli nationalists marched through East Jerusalem's old city to mark the Israeli annexation of East Jerusalem, some of them chanting racist slogans against Palestinians. The marchers hold the annual flag march to celebrate the so-called Jerusalem Day. Holder Rafael Nadal will miss the French Open after failing to regain full fitness from a hip injury suffered at the Australian Open in January. And the 14 times Roland Garros winner added he expects to retire following the 2024 season. 49 migrants from Honduras, Haiti, Venezuela, El Salvador, Brazil and Cuba who had been kidnapped from a commercial bus in central Mexico have been found. Some of the migrants told authorities that members of an organized crime group had boarded the bus when it stopped at a gas station. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we once again visit China Xiang region where Chinese President Xi Jinping organized an elegant gala event and a spectacular light display. Thank you for watching. Have an amazing weekend ahead.